Hello and welcome to this uh, set of lectures on chemical process modeling and simulation and uh, this is the second in uh, the lecture series on modeling energy of systems. In the previous lecture we sort of uh, started putting in place uh, the pieces which constitute the fundamentals of thermodynamics and as we go along in this lecture also we will be doing more of the same. The specific focus of this lecture identifying the criteria for thermodynamic equilibrium. So we talked about equilibrium as the rest states um, arising from reversible processes and what are the criteria that have to be fulfilled for a system and the surroundings or two subsystems in a system to be in equilibrium with each other. And this is a this is a fundamental question that we need to address in thermodynamics, and this will be the focus of the, this particular lecture. So now let us try and understand the energy of a system at rest states. So what will be the sort of energy of, of a system when the system is in a state of rest? The hypothesis that I am putting forth is that the rest state of the system corresponds to its minimum energy and I am going to illustrate this with some simple example. Let us first consider a macroscopic system to understand what the energy of a system is at a rest or end state. Consider a ball at rest which is placed on a hilltop at a height z equal to h from earth's surface. The macroscopic gravitational potential energy of the ball is given by mgz where uh, m is the mass of the ball, g is the acceleration due to gravity, z or z is the height from the earth's surface. As a simple model, let us assume that there is a valley from the hilltop, a valley descends and that valley is described by a two-dimensional shape parabola where z is x corner and x is the horizontal direction. In other words, if you, uh, if you look at this picture, so if one were to um, look at the horizontal direction x and this is this also is a measure of the vertical direction z because psi of z is simply mgz, m is a constant, g is a constant. So this is, this is a measure of the height, right? So z is equal to x square or z equal to x square that is your parabola and the potential energy of the ball in this quadratic valley is simply psi of x is mg x square. So now what is the minimum energy? Minimum energy, you to, to determine the minimum energy you need to set the first derivative of psi with respect to x to 0 and that means you get 2 mg x this, this minimum happens at some x equal to x star, so I put x star here and this, this is equal to 0, m is not 0, g is not 0, 2 is not 0 and therefore x star is 0, alright, oh, So this minimum energy or rest state corresponds to the, the bottom most position of the valley and note that at this value of um, x, the second derivative which is 2mg is positive and therefore this is indeed a minimum. So now we, you know, keeping this hypothesis in mind which is just being illustrated with an example, we try and uh, write what should be the criterion for equilibrium. The criterion for equilibrium should be that basically the energy should be minimum. Right? So equilibrium is a rest state of a system. For a system undergoing a reversible process, the driving force is given by the gradient of potential since a reversible process is conservative and is path independent. This was discussed in the previous lecture. For a conservative force, this potential is an energy. Therefore, there is another way of stating the criterion for equilibrium that the net driving force is zero. That's what we discussed in the previous lecture when we talked about what is equilibrium. There is no net driving force and therefore there is no net exchange of uh, energy or mass or any other modes of interactions that would cause uh, change in energy of this change in the state of the system. There is no change in the state of the system unless 
a new process gets initiated. Right? So uh, the net driving force is zero for any process is one criterion for equilibrium. But we can state the criterion for equilibrium in another way, which is basically that uh, gradient of the, uh, the potential is, is zero. So now if you have um, psi is a function of multiple variables, then you have to define basically the total differential of that variable, which is given by the, uh, the fundamental expression uh, in terms of the individual partial derivatives. All of this should be adding up to zero. D psi should be zero, isn't it? Now each partial derivative is evaluated with the other independent variables held constant. And this is the differential of that particular independent variable, right? So this is your criterion for equilibrium. Now, if x1, x2 and x3 are independent variables, then dx1, dx2 and dx3 are independent. I can independently vary x1, x2 and x3. Right? can each be very independent of others. For example, we could consider cases such as dx1 is not 0, but dx2 is 0, dx3 is 0. This would result in d psi is this partial derivative times dx1 equal to 0, because this is 0, this is 0, but dx1 is not 0, so this partial derivative should be 0. Right? Similar argument I can create where dx2 is not 0, but dx1, dx3 are 0. So this partial derivative should be 0. Similar argument I could construct for dx3 not 0, but dx1, dx2 is 0. So therefore this partial derivative should be 0. Therefore the only way d psi is 0 for all such cases would be that each of the partial derivatives of psi with respect to the independent variables x1, x2, x3 right, should be 0. This is the criteria for thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, how does this translate in our uh, practical situations? Let us particularly take uh, an arbitrary system which has isolating boundaries. In other words, the system and, uh, is isolated from the surroundings and the universe. Let the system be arbitrarily partitioned into two subsystems by an internal boundary. So you have uh, this system and uh, there is this internal system boundary, there is subsystem 1, subsystem 2 and the boundary between the system and whatever external surroundings is, is, all, is isolating and therefore there is no interaction whatsoever between the system and the outer, outer surroundings. State of the system as we uh, discussed in the previous lecture is defined by the internal energy which is given by uh, three uh, independent variables. I have uh, chosen uh, one for heat, one for moving boundary and one for uh, permeable boundary and therefore this basically are the three modes of energy interaction available that is what is considered. You could have other modes and you could write other uh, variables and the analysis that we are going to go through, the criteria that we are going to derive, uh, it is going to be, uh, the process is going to be similar and the end result will be similar as well. Now since all U, S, V, N, basically internal energy, entropy, volume and number are extensive properties, so if you add the, uh, the amounts of uh, the U1 plus U2, you should get the total internal energy. S1 plus S2, you should get total entropy. V1 plus V2, you should get total volume. And N1 plus N2, you should get total number. Number of moles or number of molecules in the system. Again, for, so, uh, for simplicity, um, let us consider that the system contains an arbitrary pure substance or only one component. Uh, we can always uh, generalize without any loss of the, uh, the core concepts, core uh, ideas uh, 
that that you could, you could extend this for multi component systems instead of a single n you will have multiple n's so each n defining for different components up to 1 2 3 4 and so on and so forth and uh, so we can proceed at time t equal t less than 0 let the in internal boundary be isolated in other words, it, let it be adiabatic, rigid and imper impermeable. These are the three work modes that have been enabled because I have written U, S, U of S, V, N. So there is three modes of uh, energy interaction. One S corresponding to heat interaction and uh, V and N corresponding to work interactions. One corresponding to moving boundary, the other N corresponding to exchange of species exchange of that particular this the component that is available so all those interactions are switched off so to speak not available at t less than zero therefore the internal boundary is isolating and the external boundaries between the system and the surroundings are already uh, isolating and therefore the two subsystems are in rest states one does not know the presence of the existence of the other and uh, the, the, the individual rest states are defined by u1 and u2. Remember, as per the state hypo, uh, state postulate, the, uh, the macroscopic state of a thermodynamic system may be defined by its internal energy. So, the two subsystems 1 and 2 are defined by u1 and u2. And since the uh, both the subsystems are isolated, there is no change in the internal energies of these two systems. So, the u1 is 0, the u2 is 0. At time t equal to 0, the internal boundary is arbitrarily made diathermal, moving and permeable. For the three modes, uh, the two work modes and one heat mode of energy interaction, the nature of the boundary is changed. Uh, let me just illustrate what this means by one simple uh, case of a moving boundary. Now suppose, you know, in the initial rest state, uh, the, the subsystem 1 has a higher internal pressure than the subsystem 2. Right? What does this mean? Then, then the moment the, the, in, the internal boundary is moving, then the, sub, the internal boundary will be pushed and the subsystem 1 will try to expand for its own. Right? Similar arguments can be made for the other two uh, modes of energy exchange as well. This means the two subsystems can now exchange heat mechanical moving boundary work and species transport work. Let the two subsystems and therefore the overall system reach a new rest state of equilibrium. So over a period of time a new equilibrium state, rest state, joint rest state for the two subsystems and therefore the system is established. What are the criteria that the two subsystems have to satisfy for this equilibrium state to be reached? This is the question that we are going to try and answer in the rest of the lecture. The overall system is in equilibrium du is 0. We have defined u as s v, a function of s v n. Therefore, the total differential u, which we are going to set equal to 0, is defined in terms of the three partial uh, the derivatives of u with respect to s at constant vn, u with respect to v at constant sn and u with respect to n at constant sv and the respective differentials of the in independent variables entropy, volume and number. We define for now again um, uh, temperature to be this partial de 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 derivative, the negative of pressure to be this partial derivative, chemical potential to be this partial derivative, to be the intensive properties temperature, pressure and chemical potential. Keep in mind that all these three are going to be discussed in a separate lecture, individual lectures for each of them. So for the time being this, this is assigned, temperature is by definition this dou u dou s at constant v n. Pressure by definition is minus dou u dou v at constant s n. Chemical potential by definition is dou u dou n at constant s v. Thus, I can write this expression, the total differential 
as the u is tds minus pdd plus mu dm the physical significance of pp and mu as well as s for example for instance are going to be presented in subsequent lecture so we say du is zero but u is u1 plus u2 therefore du is du1 plus du2 equal to zero at t less than zero du1 was also zero du2 was also zero so du was zero plus zero zero but the moment you made the internal boundary of the between the two subsystems to be diathermal moving and permeable du1 and du2 no longer individually are zeros because these two systems have started exchanging energy exchanging species one is expanding another is contracting right and therefore these two are not individually zeros but their sum is still zero because the overall system is isolated so that means du is du1 which is t1 ds1 minus p1 dv1 plus mu1 dn1 plus d2 which is t2 ds2 minus p2 dv2 plus mu2 dn2 the sum of this is zero since the overall system's boundaries are isolating the overall system properties do not change this means s equal to s1 plus s2 no matter how the partition of entropy is between the subsystem 1 and subsystem 2 the total entropy does not change because the overall system is never exchanging anything any heat with the with the surroundings that means ds is zero if at all there is a change in s1 the ds1 should be minus ds2 at time t less than zero both of these were zero but at time t greater than zero and especially once the new equilibrium state is reached ds1 is minus ds2 similarly the total volume is the same just because the internal boundary displaces it doesn't mean that the overall system volume changes so dv is zero which means dv1 is minus dv2 similarly dn1 is minus dn2 so i can then replace ds2 by minus ds1 dv2 by minus dv1 dn2 by minus dn1 in this expression therefore the criteria for equilibrium turn out to be du is t1 minus t2 ds1 minus p1 minus p2 dv1 plus mu1 minus mu2 dn1 is equal to 0 this is this is the this is the criteria for thermodynamic equilibrium however the modes of energy exchange were chosen arbitrarily in other words changing the nature of the internal system boundary this whole thing was arbitrarily chosen i mean you know so that the internal boundary was originally adiabatic now it is been made into diathermal the originally the boundary was rigid then it has now it has been made into moving originally the boundary was impermeable now it has been made permeable so this the, the this change in the internal uh, system boundary is an arbitrary choice that means i could arbitrarily set a situation where dv1 is 0 dn1 is 0 meaning the boundary is still rigid boundary is still impermeable but it's only diathermal or it is only moving or is it, it is only permeable right so the only way this criterion can be satisfied for all modes of choices of energy exchange between the two subsystems is that t1 minus t2 has to be zero t1 minus t2 has to be zero mu1 minus mu2 has to be zero which sets the equalities of temperatures pressures and chemical potentials this the equality of temperature corresponds to thermal equilibrium equality of pressure corresponds to mechanical equilibrium equality of chemical potential corresponds to chemical equilibrium in other words the criteria for thermodynamic equilibrium is that the intensive properties corresponding to each mode of energy exchange have to be constant across whichever systems are in equilibrium this is the criteria that we end up obtaining for thermodynamic equilibrium with that we come to the end of this lecture i'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have you you can always as always contact me either through the youtube channel or through a person contacts
thank you very much for uh, listening to this lecture uh, you i hope you have a wonderful day